Good morning from India, good afternoon in most parts of Southeast Asia, and good evening in the United States and other parts of the world as well. I have great pleasure in welcoming all of you to the second day of this international virtual conference on reimagining and transforming legal education and law schools. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the 11th thematic session of this conference on the theme, Role of Legal Studies in Reinventing Law School. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal Global University. We have a very distinguished set of uh, panelists who will be reflecting on this theme. Let me begin by introducing my colleague uh, who will be moderating the session, Professor Dr. Prabhakar Singh, Associate Professor at Jindal Global Law School of OP Jindal Global University. We have with us Professor Camille Nelson, Dean of the William Richardson School of Law, University of Hawaii in the United States. Uh, Professor Eric Jensen, a director of the Rule of Law Program at Stanford Law School, Stanford University. Professor Dr. Simon Chesterman, Dean of the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. And Professor Michael Adams, head of the School of Law of the University of New England, Australia. With those words, I'm going to hand this over to Professor Prabhakar Singh, and I'll see you a little later. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session, the first session of second day of our uh, conference. Uh, <clears throat> the session uh, is titled Role of uh, Legal Studies in Reinventing Law School. Now, former U.S. President Barack Obama, while commenting on the nature of legal education, had said, the study of law can be disappointing at times, a matter of applying narrow rules and arcane procedure to an uncooperative reality, a shot of glorified accounting that serves to regulate the affairs of those who have power, and that all too often seeks to explain, and to those who do not, the ultimate wisdom and justness of their conditions. But that's not all the law is. The law is also memory. The law also records a long-running conversation, a nation arguing with its conscience. While things at the heart of law are important, Equally important are things around and about law, the subject matter of legal studies. Such a meta view of the law is thus is indispensable to understand the functioning of legal system. Things around law also help to understand the manner in which statutes and rules come into existence and the reasons behind their success or failure. The pandemic has laid bare many shortcomings and lacuna in public law, even paralyzing it to a certain extent prompting lawmakers and jurists to look beyond the conventional doctrinal approaches to the discipline. They have had to reorient their focus from law's functions to law's failings. At a time like this, when legal systems are being reimagined, it is imperative for law schools to encourage students to look beyond the insights of law to its history, epistemology, and phenomenology. Recent reports have explained the existential crisis faced by institutions of higher education and learning, especially law schools, in the face of the pandemic, even going to the extent of calling this phase traditional legal education's Waterloo. This is for the reason that legal training has often undermined the importance of the peripheries of law, including the voices therein, by overly relying on the internal hermeneutics of legal reasoning. The meta approach to legal studies has the potential to reinvent law schools into spaces which are more futuristic, better equipped to leverage rapid technological advancements to offer novel data-driven and heuristic solutions to complex problems. It can, reach, it can teach students to speak truth to power and the ethical boundaries whose infringement has been brought sharply into focus with every industry's less than human response to the pandemic. This session will facilitate a discussion on how legal studies can reconceive and reorganize law schools and legal education during and in the after, aftermath of the pandemic. So, um, so that, is, that, is, that is what we have set uh, as the perimeter of our conversation. Um, we would like to have first response um, uh, on, 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 the, on the role of legal studies in reinventing law school. And if I could request Professor Nelson, Sure. Thank you very much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all all over the world today, really. It's, it's a, a measure of our, our, our shrinking world that we're all here today and in this way. So I, I, wanna, I want to um, challenge a little bit the uh, notion that uh, law schools don't already, to an evolving extent, 
embed what you're framing as legal studies uh, writ large. I think that increasingly um, over the last several decades that law schools have really incorporated notions of the way law informs politics and politics inform law. Law involves, uh, you know, informs economics and economics involves, informs law. Technology, psychology, sociology, certainly critical race theory, cultural studies, history, the embeddedness of technological innovation and such, as well as indigeneity and internationality. So I, I don't know that there is a pure notion in the way it's been framed of law schools, right? I think it's, it depends on the law schools, it depends on the faculty member, it depends on the course being taught. Uh, I, I think definitionally there's been much, I think what you might frame as evolution or progress in certain spheres such that very few people, I think, hold the sort of airtight notion of law schools that perhaps is being proposed as distinct from legal studies. Certainly, I know that m myself and many people um, who have grown up in the law, as I have, never held firm to that sort of purest sensibility, perhaps. So that's, that's the frame from which I operate, but I'd like to learn more, and I'm certainly open to hearing how perhaps there has not been that uh, evolution, as it were, elsewhere, but, but that's certainly been my sense of, of my legal education in Canada and the U.S., and certainly my role um, as a, a leader in higher ed over the last decade in the US. So uh, I think there's been much um, transformation. Hopefully it's an evolution and it's progress, but certainly there has been much that's been changed in the last several decades. Thank you, Professor Nensel. On that note, I'd like to uh, request Professor Chesterman to reflect on this, um, uh, particularly how um, the NUS uh, law school where I had the privilege of studying is balancing the study of doctrine uh, and commercial law with uh, increasingly sort of dealing issues with theory. And I've seen that, you know, uh, that, uh, that the law school there is actually, uh, you know, uh, in some ways making that switch uh, very successfully. So, Professor Chesterman. Thanks so much, Prabhaka. And I, I agree completely with Camille that this is, this is a problem, but it's not really a new problem as such. Although, as, as I'll say, uh, I do think there are some new dimensions to it. Uh, in terms of what we've been doing, uh, it's really only in the last 20 years that we really shifted our educational paradigm away from a pretty doctrinal theoretical basis. Uh, and we still do doctrine. We still do that sort of the what the law is. I think it's important that all law graduates need to know sort of what a tort is, the elements of criminal offences and so on. Uh, and so that, that sort of doctrinal part remains. But we supplement it with two others. Uh, and the second is uh, we ensure that all of our students develop perspectives on the law, the sort of why the law is the way that it is. Uh, and we do that through theory, through comparative law. Uh, and, and in that sense, I think Singapore is a little bit unusual uh, in that we're an extremely small jurisdiction. Uh, but my faculty of 70 or so faculty members, there is no one on our faculty who is only educated in Singapore. Every single member of the faculty has a degree from some other jurisdiction. So I think that helps in terms of the perspectives. Uh, and then the third thing that we try and do is uh, give our students a chance to explore how the law is practiced, experiential learning, uh, where I think we were a little bit slower on clinics than the United States. Uh, Australia is also developing its clinical programs. But those are the things that we try to do. But in terms of the, the, the question you're asking, is something really changing as a result of our world? I think there are, there are two forces at work that we do need to grapple with, and they're globalization and technology. Uh, globalization, nothing new really, uh, but uh, increasing pressure on the profession uh, to embrace globalization, uh, to outsource what can be outsourced, and that's introducing commercial pressures on the practice of law uh, that I think imposes obligations on us at law school uh, to prepare our students for that, that transformed world. Uh, and technology also obviously is transforming the practice of law, the role of AI, machine learning, not in overtaking the complete role that lawyers play and judges play, uh, but in transforming that role. Uh, and so I think that those are two areas in which we do have to adapt the law school curriculum. Uh, and like other law schools around the world, we're doing our best to do so, to prepare our students, not just for a world that is transformed, uh, but uh, prepare our students to, to play a key role in that transformation itself. 
Thank you, Professor Chesterman. Can I now, now request Professor Jensen to tell us about how the Stanford Law School is um, looking at legal studies and legal studies during the pandemic? Thank you. Well, uh, I don't know what to add uh, beyond uh, Professor Nelson, Professor Chesterman. They, they, they stole the wind from my sail. Uh, but uh, let me add just a couple of uh, thoughts. Uh, law students, as they're, they're entering uh, these days at, at, at Stanford, are uh, demanding a lot of faculty. And uh, actually, the, the Stanford climate is one where students take uh, initiative and actually participate in the, the, the shaping of a, of a curriculum. But students who are entering these days are demanding uh, policy-relevant uh, legal studies, uh, given the incredible challenges we have in public health, in public education, in uh, a competent and uh, legally objective uh, bureaucracy. Uh, these uh, climate change, all of these issues uh, are on the top of students' minds. So they don't really want to uh, in, engage in, in uh, uh, you know, considering how many angels dance on the head of a pen. Uh, it is true, and I agree with Professor Chesterman, that doctrinal studies are still important. And thinking like a lawyer is still important. And we shouldn't be ashamed of, uh, of that. Nevertheless, we have uh, a bewildering array of social, political, and economic problems in, in the world today that legal studies should and must be relevant to. Um, so I'll just say, you know, Paul Brest uh, wrote an 11-page memorandum for new students coming into uh, uh, the, the law school this year on uh, all of the classes that we have on uh, policy-relevant classes and uh, social problem solving. And I think this is really at the heart of all sorts of things that we're trying to do in uh, an expanded definition of legal studies. But I think the definition that was articulated in, in sort of the problematique to, to get a reaction to, it was a problem back in the 60s. And Mark Lanter and David Trubeck wrote about this in you know, 1971 in Scholars and Self-Estrangement. Even that critique I thought was overstated and not as well informed as it could have been. Uh, but uh, we've been thinking about law and law and political science, law and economics, law and uh, uh, other things for uh, for a long time. And indeed, the, the Stanford Law faculty has economists, political scientists, sociologists, uh, psychologists, uh, uh, medical doctors on the faculty to assure that that we're at the intersection of the critical problems that we face today. Thank you, Professor Jenshin. In fact, to add to what you just said. Uh, the 60s, 1960s was the generation in India where, with the help of four foundation money, institutions, institutions were set up to, in India, for instance, the, the Indian Law Institute, which is just next to the Supreme Court. And there was a lot of exchange of uh, American professors in particular, you know, Quincy Wright and others. I know uh, many of them in international law. And also the Wisconsin Law School, that is actually the hub of doing South Asian studies, which mixes law with social sciences beautifully, actually. So a lot of us, in that sense, get instruction from uh, the Wisconsin uh, sort of, you know, group that you just mentioned. Um, uh, so now I request our uh, fourth panelist, uh, uh, Professor Adams, uh, to reflect on how legal studies has already started doing or has already done, or are we moving towards something which is not uh, just law, but ju law and something in Australian, uh, in the Australian scenario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share uh, what's happening in Australia. For the last 30 years, we have managed, uh, I guess, to probably be different to some of the other jurisdictions that we're talking about in the sense of uh, the research shows that 50% of all law graduates with a law degree have no intention to practice law. So in other words, half of our cohorts, not just here at UNE, but across Australia, make the decision quite early on that with their law and their other degree, whether it be in business to go into the commercial world, if it's in uh, criminology into that sphere, if it's into uh, in that languages, a whole range of international studies and policy, politics, uh, even good old Bachelor of Arts in history. It means that in fact, in the classroom scenario, 
you're, you cannot make the assumption that the people are going on to practice law. Now, obviously, every law degree is accredited by the admitting authorities to make sure uh, students, once they graduate, can have that opportunity, but many are not as interested in practice. And so that is actually an ongoing tension. To pick up on your second point, which was really around how have legal studies, uh, I guess, informed, I agree particularly with Professor Chesterman, the role of technology has been absolutely critical. And it's interesting that this uh, last year, this law school had a major review of its law curriculum. And in fact, we introduced a major capstone unit being technology and the law, whereby half the course looked at what are the technologies a legal practitioner really needs to handle, often things we don't talk about at, at law school, that's left to the practitioners. But actually the second half and the bit more relevant to here is what is the impact on big data artificial intelligence, and then more specialist things such as the COVID safe app, you know, down to specific uh, things like drones, and then looking at the reign of doctrinal laws around that problem and trying to critically think, so bring those different strands of policy and, and politics and underlying social adhesion. So it is interesting, as I said, the big thing to remember in, in Australia is that in the classroom scenario, uh, uh, you will find, yes, about half do not intend to practice law as a solicitor or barrister, an attorney. They intend to use their legal training in a much broader concept, and that does inform our particular curriculum. Thank you. So now, now that uh, uh, we've had views from all <clears throat> four of you, I find it interesting that Professor Nelson should sort of start um, with the assertion that we've never thought law is uh, always, the, you know, law is this pure discipline that doesn't interact with other social sciences. In India, we are used to saying all the time that uh, uh, it's the lived experience that informs our understanding of the law for a number of colonial and other post-colonial reasons. So, and it's interesting that Professor Jensen said that we should not be ashamed of, <clears throat> of the doctrine and teaching of doctrine. Um, I think this is, this is what is, uh, th th this is, uh, in general, is the is the is the line of thinking among critical and doctrinal lawyers. Uh, very recently, in a blog post, uh, another professor at NUS, um, uh, Professor Anthony Angi, said that um, the 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 study of the critical aspect of law starts with doing the doctrine first. We must understand the doctrine and understand what are the problems that this uh, what are the problems these doctrines are generating, or maybe they're not addressing or not not touching issues, being too narrow. Uh, and not uh, and not sort of uh, open to uh, problems of certain community, um, certain group within different jurisdictions. So, so I would like um, uh, uh, all of you to sort of reflect on this. I mean, doctrine versus doctrine theory and the practice of law. And how does that? How does uh, legal academy post pandemic with technology respond to that? Because access to technology also a money matter. Not every man has the same kind of uh, internet access, you know, quality of phone. Now I realize more and more quality of phone is such an issue. Uh, so so good, good internet connection, quality of, uh, you know, phones you have, or, you know, laptops you have uh, to, of course, uh, 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 how we connect uh, these day-to-day -day problems faced by students of different economic, socioeconomic backgrounds uh, with their reception of the law that already makes the teaching of doctrine rather law and something. So Professor Nelson. So I, I, I think your question is sort of the, the question of the, of the moment in so many ways for so many of us. Um, I think focusing on context, right? So the milieu in which the law operates functions or doesn't function, right? The law's functionality and dysfunctionality, I believe is contextualized and historical, right? So to the extent that we find ourselves in this historical moment, at least in the United States, but certainly in many, many parts of the world where we have a, what's many have called racial reckoning, right? And that, that cuts in many ways, in many places, it's intersectional, it's uh, post-colonial presumably, or neo-colonial, depending on your perspective, right? There's a lot going on there that brings history to the fore. There's of course the, the omnipresence of the pandemic and its sequelae. And here we also had the sort of uh, everything around the election. So there's a sort of heightened, um, a heightened moment 
uh, in this national context. And as was said, the students coming in are also coming into a space anxious for solving problems, including climate justice concerns, right? So on the one hand, we have a real, frankly, consistent with our accreditation dictates, need to educate on the doctrine to ensure appropriate licensure guarantees, let's put it that way, or thresholds are across. Even if we know that the, the reality is not all of our students are, are going to end up practicing or practicing long term. And at the same time, we have a, a thirst on the part of the students and the faculty to address this looming culture and this crisis and this context. And, you know, I think it's the moment of now, but as a as a professor who's taught contracts, torts, and criminal law as my three foundational courses and then my seminars, I'll just take contract criminal law for an example. I think it's hard in the States and in Canada to disentangle the doctrine from the history, from the culture, certainly from race relations, um, in increasingly from innovation with body cams, you know, from critical race theory, from feminist studies when you're talking about sexual um, assault and rape, from queer studies when you're talking about like gay panic defenses. And I mean, so I, I think it's, it's got to be a real concerted, um, attention to those threads that inform the doctrine in many cases, or else it abstracts the law to the point that it is for many of our students and, and diverse faculty increasingly just a fiction, right? To act as if it's neutral begs the question of how did we get to this even notion of the reasonable man, for example, as informing the elements of doctrine. So I, I see it as sort of like, you know, I'm a visual learner. There's a bit of a lava lamp phenomenon, right? They, they meld and they merge into each other or else what we're talking about, even as the doctrine is so abstracted from our realities and our history as to be, you know, um, anathema to anything that would make sense for so many people in our classrooms increasingly, which then begs again the diversity and inclusion question. So, which then tethers to the racial reckoning moment. So I'll stop there because I've tried to load in a lot, but I obviously see a lot of this as multidisciplinary, um, historical and interdisciplinary with a heavy dose of, of internationality. Uh, thanks for that uh, comment, and the, and it's interesting you mentioned the idea of visual learner. Actually, in a classic uh, social science setup in India, we always say that you know it was Hegel who said, "Well, ideas come from the mind," and uh, his best student Marx, uh, you know, overturned him to say ideas come from our lived lived experience. So we're mm -hmm. back to the same Hegel versus Marx Marxist question of how, what is it that 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 makes us learn, or what is it that puts idea ideas in our head? So with that view, I'm, I'd like to go to Professor Jensen um, uh, to sort of get some comments on doctrine versus lived experience and how do we balance it? Or do I, we thought, balance? Uh, I thought Professor Nelson put it very articulately, but I, I will uh, supplement to the, uh, to the extent I can. Uh, I, I think the doctrinal uh, teaching itself today has evolved uh, because the students have evolved and the, the, uh, the discipline of law has, has evolved where it's become, uh, Stanford was at the forefront of interdisciplinary legal studies back in the 1980s, but everyone's working on interdisciplinary legal studies now. And in a, in a sense, that informs uh, how doctrinal courses are taught. History matters a lot more. Uh, societal context matters a, a lot more. So I think even within the more narrow doctrinal realm, you have I, I wouldn't call it a revolution because I don't think revolutions happen within that narrow doc doctrinal realm, but, but a, a significant change over time uh, because the student body, again, really wants to talk about problems of the day and what their training might do to solve some of the problems of the day. Um, there are all sorts of uh, uh, careers. Uh, uh, Professor Adams mentioned uh, that half of their, his students uh, want to do things other than law. Certainly that's the case at, at Stanford too. I would say 80 to 85% of our students go into big law, uh, big Wall Street firms and the like to start their careers. That's not where they end their careers for the most part these days. Many are, are, are founding uh, nonprofits. They're working in the space of environmental, climate, racial justice. 
they're trying to relate their their legal experience to uh, uh, to the problems of uh, of the day. I'd also say that within the doctrinal space, there's nothing wrong with thinking like a lawyer. Uh, the the discipline of logical progression in in writing and speaking uh, actually. Law isn't the only uh, place in which you can have that sort of critical uh, engagement of, of, of thinking critically, but uh, law classes are a great platform for honing those, uh, uh, those skills. Uh, and I'll just say one last thing about uh, the meaning of a, a, a law degree today. I mean, I can't think of another time in my lifetime, apart from maybe post uh, uh, Watergate, where entering legal studies and entering legal education is more relevant. Uh, we've just been through, uh, we are in the midst of a rule of law recession globally and have been profoundly for the last 10 years. And if you notice things that have gone on in, in, in this country and trying to undermine bureaucratic capability and the like, and the fight against uh, that undermining of the rule of law and bureaucratic capability, that's led by lawyers. Uh, take up the good cause. Uh, so, so taking from you the the cue on uh, this um, global sort of awareness about interdisciplinarity, um, I'd like to know from uh, from Professor Chesterman how is um, interdisciplinarity working in and around Singapore in ASEAN, if I may sort of uh, expand it to this, uh, you know, not just to Singapore but generally um, in the whole of ASEAN, you know. So, so in Singapore, we're very explicit that, that, that Singapore has to be global. Uh, Singapore has to engage with the region. That means we need to understand the region. Um, but I, I wanted to, to echo some of the comments uh, about the, the nature of law. I mean, unlike, so Michael said about half of his graduates uh, might not practice law, Eric slightly more, 97% of our graduates practice law for a while. But six years later, half of them are doing other things. Uh, and indeed, one of the sort of radical things I did as dean was start promoting the achievements of our alumni outside of the law. So obviously, we've got great graduates who do things in the law, the chief justice, attorney general, and so on. But we've also got playwrights, we've got diplomats, we've got business people. Uh, and I think this really points to a, a tension which we're dancing around, which is whether a law school is a professional school or an academic institution. Uh, and of course, it's both. Uh, we do need to train people who can be competent lawyers, and that's a powerful role in society. I'll say something about that in a second. Uh, but law is also a fantastic way to understand society, to understand how power is managed and the kind of problems that Eric's pointing to uh, that the United States is experiencing, uh, which is echoed in other places around the world. Uh, and I'll just put this in the context of the pandemic, because I remember as the, the consequences of the pandemic became more and more apparent, uh, uh, some colleagues and some students were saying, gee, it's a shame lawyers aren't really useful in this situation. We can't produce the cure. We can't heal people. But lawyers are vital in a time like this, vital to ensure that the pain of dealing with the pandemic is spread equitably, that the vaccine, when it comes out, is shared fairly, uh, and that the surveillance powers that have been so important in curbing the impact of the virus are limited to what's necessary and limited for the duration that's necessary. Uh, and I think that really comes back to a point that Camille was making, that you can't understand law without understanding power. Uh, and indeed, law is power. Law is about how power is regulated in society. Uh, and I think the, the people who study that, it's clearly an important thing to think about. Uh, but it's also an important thing when you send graduates out into the world, that they have a sense not just of how to, how to be a lawyer, how to do that technical stuff, uh, but what the impact of a lawyer can and should be. In fact, yeah, my sense is that when uh, uh, lawyers graduate from here and uh, in a session yesterday, one of the leading uh, firm partners said that in fact, once, once they enter the law firm, we have to re-educate them because law in India at the law schools are done in a very uh, different way. And perhaps we are looking at problem solving with clients in mind. So we do some sort of retraining and <clears throat> that's how um, sort of they, re they restart their life at the law firm. And then as you've mentioned, um, you know, five or six years, uh, six years later, they uh, sort of choose to branch out into different directions. So <clears throat> my question to Professor Adams is, how is it that, uh, that uh, uh, inter the, the aspects of interdisciplinarity uh, 
uh, is playing out in the Australian academia? I mean, is it is it is it um, uh, by being at the law school that they actually encounter or mm, develop diverse uh, interests, or is it that they are they have some sort of uh, uh, or, or this happens after the law school ends? Thank you. That's a, an excellent question again. And I also can I say I agree with. Uh, Many of the comments that have already been made, particularly Professor Nelson's view of those intersections at this point in time, is bringing together many issues which have been debated over the last, you know, 10, 20 years, if not longer, but it's sort of come to a flashpoint. And I, I loved her expression in the moment because so many things have been broadcast. The other is I think we're taking for granted um, our ability to know what's happening in the world at any point in time. You know, let's just take the vaccine. You know, as the two, I believe, American pharmaceutical companies launched theirs, and then the one out of uh, the UK, out of Oxford University, the speed of which we know literally how many doses have been bought. Uh, you, I, I'm not sure if it's in your news, but for us, our national airline Qantas, um, we'll only let people fly once they've had the vaccine, once it's been released, you know, and of course that brings up a whole bunch of legal requirements. Um, and they're comparing it to the equivalent of yellow fever, where we already have some regulations. Uh, in each of our jurisdictions, I'm sure we have some anti-vaccinators and people, in fact, I even had a senior academic colleague talk about thalidomide and the, you know, if we give uh, medication, we don't know all the consequences, you know, do I have the right to decline? You know, you can imagine the legal issues that arise. To come to the heart of your question is, I probably, I also agree that the doctrinal methodologies um, which are so ingrounded in our profession, which fell back, you know, in that sense, thousands of years, particularly under a common law system, does have an impact. And so, and again, uh, Professor Nelson, I think, encapsulated beautifully when she said she thought criminal law, contracts and torts, in many ways, and I don't do, wish to diminish, I'm a corporate lawyer by, by training, <laughs> once you get those basics right, it's amazing how you can then apply it probably with uh, equity and trust, those sort of concepts, across a whole range of fields. And then, of course, one of the things we certainly know from education, and I've been a, a professor for over 30 years, is that those building blocks are interconnected. How many times do we come across a student who fails to connect that, in fact, uh, a criminal act, for example, and I'm now thinking in the area of employment law, whereby, say, you have an accident at work, you know, there's a civil claim under tort that we have a, a compensation scheme called workers' compensation, uh, which is also a civil law. But we also have occupational health and safety laws, which have a criminal um, protection to make employers do the right thing. And they all interface. And if we don't understand that interaction of our civil court system and our criminal court system and the way our, our, our legal system works, it all falls apart. But it is all based on relatively straightforward doctrine. So how we then apply it, and, and I also uh, agree with all the speakers, around the, the, the student coming in, and again, if I can put it in a time context, you probably will remember that the uh, Sydney hosted the Olympic Games in the year 2000, and it was a wonderful world success. My heart goes out to Tokyo, that this year, of course, they should have hosted the Olympics, and uh, that's been deferred for another year. And... And my mind is thinking that when I started to remind my first year law teachers that these students in law school now weren't born when the Sydney Olympics were hosted. And so that idea that they come with a world, uh, a different worldview, they've always had an internet connection. Pretty well from you know, late primary school, early high school, they will have had a mobile phone with internet access. So when they come, the idea of going to a traditional law library and pulling books out is, is so foreign to them. They're used to information being served in a particular way with speedy access. And our courts and our legal system, our parliaments overall, have tended to bring that information together. But I think it is that multidisciplinary aspect. And I guess I was incredibly impressed, and we don't have it here within the law school at Stanford, talking about having a medical doctors and sociologists and psychiatrists and a whole bunch of other disciplines in-house, that's something we certainly don't. But as a university, we do break down those boundaries and we certainly have those interactions across our many faculties. So we are, we are living in a very exciting time 
but the interrelationship, I think we, this is where the profession comes into play, does expect some basic understanding of the law. The other area we haven't touched on, of course, is the ethics domain and the professional responsibilities. Because sometimes in the areas, dare I say, of plagiarism and basic cheating in any shape or form, reminding the lawyers, uh, certainly in Australia, become officers of the court. And there is that higher duty that is expected and distinguishes from society. The other is the role of pro bono and, and in, so in encouraging people to take on activities outside their own personal benefits. So, so, so far we've talked about uh, the concept, uh, concept of law as it were about law as purely doctrinal to law, mixing law with uh, uh, social sciences to sort of reflect more uh, accurately our lived experiences. Uh, so my next question to all the panelists is that how does, uh, so this understanding this concept of law as teachers and how, does, how do you effectively transfer this in the class? Because in my uh, experiences uh, of teaching in India has been that we, mostly people are welcome to this because they're seeing the reality and to use Professor Nelson's uh, idea of visual learning. But there's also some resistance saying this is not law and we would like to you know, know law in this way. Students also demand because now uh, we are moving to this demand supply model of uh, teaching uh, are, are being uh, law teaching. So, so reflections on how, how are you transferring this uh, into the classroom effectively and what problems do you face with Professor Nelson? So one of the things that I think is really interesting to consider is the classroom as a place of mutual learning. So the, the professor, of course, is the one charged with, you know, sort of managing the classroom. But I also want to suggest that we have much to learn from our students in terms of flipping the hypotheticals into the present moment in uh, contemporary ways, let's put it that way, right? So, so how can we continue to have those conversations with them that take a traditional doctrine and flip it to TikTok or flip it to some dating app or think about the ways that it brings it alive in ways that they are more familiar with perhaps in terms of the problems that immediately confront and again, I'm generalizing because, of course, many of us have large spans of ages in our classroom, but they're present and lived reality, right? So, so sometimes the examples in the cases and the analyses seem um, quaint. You know, I'll just give, and, you know, I remember talking to him. We were at a cabin years ago in the Midwest and my kids, and this was over a decade ago, there was a rotary phone, right? The dialing phone. M my kids had no idea what it was. I mean, they could figure it out, <laughs> but it was like this ridiculous thing connected to the wall with this, like this was just something that was like an antique to them. And I think many of us grew up with those phones, right? And, and even the notions of, you know, microwaves being ancient te technology and, you know, many of us still use forms of social media that our students aren't even using anymore. And we have to encourage them to check emails and such, right? And to, to check their, our Facebook pages and such. So I do think we have an obligation to think about how to make uh, doctrine live in the present moment in ways that deal with the cutting edge modern problems. And I think we can do that. But I think it behooves the faculty member to also be, be willing to engage with those possibilities, be they in ride sharing or whatever is next. And I think that, that to just say we bring as faculty into the classroom our expertise, but we can also pull from the problems that are, are seen as most pressing for our students to make that um, experience uh, pop off the paper, as it were. Yeah, so taking from you the idea of uh, teaching as learning, teaching is not only teaching, I'd like to ask from Professor Jensen, um, how do you combine this teaching of doctrine with lived experience and, and, uh, and, and tie this with uh, assessment criteria? Because <clears throat> as, as teachers, I sometimes feel that students uh, in the moment of learning law are for the 90% of the times concerned about grades. So for them, grades is the reflection of what they have done. And so, and this is a constant worry, creating all kinds of problems, particularly during the time of the pandemic where, you know, internet becomes the thing um, through which everything happens. So this has also created, I think, stress among students for us, this idea of being graded and, and completely sort of changing the old model. 
so I don't know exactly where to start in answering this question because my whole world is uh, being overemployed in experiential learning. That's what I do. And, and that's uh, a high demand of students is experiential learning. I respect what my colleagues do in uh, teaching doc doctrine. I know the importance of it, but I'm uh, overemployed on demand for experiential learning. My, my students write textbooks critically analyzing the laws of Afghanistan, of Iraq, uh, of Rwanda, of uh, 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 Cambodia, uh, where we have peer review committees in each of these countries, making sure that we've got the context right, because law is all about context. And if you don't have the context, you're going to miss a good deal of uh, what's, what's important. Um, the, uh, and, and so that's all I do is experiential learning. I, I, I cross many countries with uh, different groups of students uh, trying to Im impart to them, and they get it, uh, the importance of context and the importance of understanding what's going on. And they, they take these projects with a, with a high level of, uh, of humility. Um, I, uh, Paul Brest and I lead a project, a research project at Stanford on uh, rule of non-law. Our observation is that uh, I, uh, countries, despite neoclassical claims to the contrary, seem to grow and grow phenomenally well, even if legal systems are underdeveloped. Uh, take Singapore's uh, legal system, Simon, in 1960. Uh, and, and Singapore was on a trajectory of, of economic growth long before its, its legal institutions came of age. And we see this China, India, uh, all of the, uh, the, the uh, East Asian tiger countries. Uh, and our, our students actually work on, on case studies, looking at the Yakuza, for example, how, how an, uh, uh, the Japanese mafia works and to the, ex the, the extent to which it can be controlled by law. We uh, critique uh, legal and judicial reform projects around the world, case studies that my, my uh, staff and I write on what, what's gone wrong in these legal and judicial reform uh, projects at the World Bank and other, uh, other donors. What were the assumptions made? Where did they go wrong? And uh, on, on your uh, point on assessment, uh, criteria, uh, Provocker. Um, as Stanford moved to uh, uh, take, trying to take pressure off of students to moving to just honors, pass, and, and, and fail. Um, I think this has been a mixed experiment. Yale has the, the, the same criteria, but we actually have uh, a curve. So we can only give so many H's. Uh, Yale isn't so constrained. I think I think it's taken some pressure off of students, but I must say, uh, as one who does a lot of grading, it's rather unsatisfactory to have such a binary system where you have students who almost get an H, but because of uh, grading on a curve, I cannot give uh, that, that H. So trying to get away from grades, I think, is, uh, is important. Trying to infuse you know, real learning in the classroom that isn't just rooted in grades is important. And uh, Camilla, I just want to, mention one point on, on how we learn from our students. A few years ago, I was in Rwanda with two of my students. They both happened to be African-American women. And we sat at the dinner table for three nights and I learned that race relations in America wasn't nearly what I thought it was. Uh, and, and that was a self-correction. I, I lived out of the country for a long time, but when I came back, I thought many of these things were progressing and they certainly weren't. And we've just lived through a summer that shows how, how we, we weren't. But I just wanted to mention that example is, you know, listening to students and, and what their needs are and what their aspirations are is really important in making sure that our curriculum overall is relevant. And that's a credit to you for being willing to listen, not just to respond, but listening to learn. Yeah. As lawyers, I think often our tendency is we're listening to respond. And then the audacity sometimes of us as faculty is we also forget that we are always students of the law as well. So kudos to you as well on, on, for mentioning that and being willing to, to absorb it. So Professor Chesterman, um, so given that um, in Singapore and in larger Asia, um, the way we see teachers is very different from the way we see teachers in Australia, or, um, US and European jurisdictions. Um, not that there is disrespect for teacher in that jurisdiction. The power relations are very different. I mean, and India and China are comparable, India less so and China more. So how does, 
uh, uh, you know, taking the cue from Professor Nelson's point of learning from students happen because they're generally more quiet at, in any ways, they're more listeners than uh, participants. Uh, maybe this is changing with international students, but how do we do deal uh, teaching and assessment now during the pandemic in any ways in, in Asia generally? Yeah, so, um, so I've been based, I'm an Australian national educated in Europe, uh, worked for, in the United States for six years and then been here for 14 years. And I think in the 14 years I've been teaching in Singapore, the students are getting more talkative. I mean, there are fewer and fewer students who, when, when I first arrived, I noted if you walk down a corridor, some students will stop and bow as the teacher goes past. Those days are gone. Uh, and I think uh, that's a good thing. Um, the students are more talkative in class. Singapore is becoming a little bit more open, a little bit more liberal. Uh, students are certainly becoming more opinionated. I think that's a good thing. And I think two things are driving that. One is just the social milieu is changing. The, the idea of sort of government uh, by meritocracy alone is no longer accepted without, without criticism. And again, I think that's a political maturity that Singapore is experiencing, that's healthy. But we've also encouraged it by essentially structuring incentives because Singapore students, Prabhaka, you will know well, are very focused on grades, uh, like, like all of our students are, but they also respond to incentives. So I have a whole speech when the students come in as freshers uh, that uh, many of them have come through a school system which prioritizes doing well in tests, but for many of them, doing well in tests means that the teacher knows the answer to the question and your job in the test is to provide that answer under exam conditions. But in law school, as we all know, the question is the thing. Uh, often faculty, when they present a problem, they don't really care what the answer is. They wanna know how you frame the question, how you will interpret it, how you will interrogate it, what evidence you will marshal. Uh, and so we make that clear to students and then we give grades for class participation and make it clear that class participation is a quality, not quantity thing. And you get zero points for agreeing with me. I'm, I'm, I can agree with myself, that's very easy. I'm always encouraging students to criticize me, uh, which is exactly the point that, that Camille and Eric have made about the extent to which we learn from our students. Uh, the only other thing I would say on this is that even as we go in that direction of empowering our students and learning from our students, and I, I think we all know how much we do learn in the classroom, um, there is still an element of the students do need to eat their vegetables. Uh, so it shouldn't just be sort of pandering to students. I think the students do need to work hard. They should work hard uh, because law is hard, uh, but the benefits are hopefully worth all of that effort. So Professor Adams, um, uh, what is uh, your experience of um, classroom teaching and assessment uh, during the time of pandemic? Uh, you spoke about technology at length, but how does it, uh, how is it working yeah. now? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was the dean of a law school in Sydney um, for a decade, and that we were predominantly an on-campus university. And then uh, I moved to here to Armidale, which is uh, six hours from Sydney and six hours from Brisbane inland, Australia's highest city. And we are 93% fully online. So I have now a very different cohort. In fact, our average student is a 36-year-old female with two uh, children living in a metropolitan area who is actually changing careers. So they are much more mature, uh, much more time savvy. They, they want to be very efficient in what they're doing, but also they have a sort of different level of maturity. So our school leavers make up only about 7% or so and pre uh, COVID, they lived on campus. So when COVID really hit Australia in March, we in fact as a university switched to 100% online. And obviously in the areas of law and business, we made that transition very quickly and very easily. To pick up on your point about assessment, um, that certainly we, for accreditation purposes, are required to have supervised exams, and we have gone over to using OLX, you know, online exams, um, which has some good and bad aspects. We use a product out of America called Proctor U, which I'm sure some of you may have heard of, uh, for that supervision of exams. But we have found problems, everything from poor internet connections through to uh, a cohort of students who just aren't used to doing that sort of online exam and, and uh, mental and health issues through pandemics, as well as just environments where your children are, are in your home, uh, you may have lost your job, uh, and, and on it goes. So I'm sure each of our countries have suffered through that, that period of change. 
So I have to say, overall, um, it has been a challenging time. I, I would like to just say that it, I mentioned technology in the law. One of the things we did do was actually provide sort of some more practical assessments, such as writing a memorandum to a managing partner and giving a statement of advice, which again, ironically, is very legal focused. But the assessment task as for graduating students was around showing the sort of work they will do in practice, but around technology. And I have to say the student feedback has been very positive to understand for their future careers. So, um, so yes, you're, you're quite right. It has certainly been a challenging time, but I also think it provides a lot of opportunities. The other, of course, is just our global availability of information. The fact that case law and legislation as basic tools, as well as the research papers, are available, available globally. Our libraries now have better access than ever to official government information as well as institutional information. So the free access movement has got more and more papers available uh, rather than the paid walls, the, you know, the difficulties of, of subscription through libraries. More research is now publicly available than ever before. So, thank you. So, so the pandemic hit us at a time when we had begun to generate some kind of pride in sort of all of us uh, in whatever corner of world we are in, uh, in becoming more global through exchange programs of teachers and also students. So now, since that is stalled, stalled and everything is more, uh, technology driven, um, uh, um, uh, uh, we would like to know how, um, what, is, what is it uh, uh, that we can, comp uh, how do we compensate the, the, the uh, benefits uh, that we would have had from exchange programs and bringing um, diversity, uh, global diversity in the classroom now that we are, yeah, we are in the pandemic uh, situation? Uh, how does, uh, how and to what extent does technology help us replace uh, the old model of, you know, traveling and knowing in the classroom, global classroom, so to speak? I'm happy to fire, if I may, with a, a couple of quick examples, because uh, Australia is a long way from everywhere else. So in that sense, it's something that tyranny and distance, and I, and I want to say up front, student exchange and faculty exchange is incredibly important. I think we look forward to, you know, even a conference like this. Yes, there's some benefits and we'll make this all available without the travel, but imagine if we'd gone for a meal, how different this, this conversation would be because of our, our own personal interactions. And as uh, Professor Nelson said, you know, our ability to listen to each other and understand. But the examples I want to give, um, during the pandemic, I actually interviewed 20 different uh, lawyers and academics from around the world, from China, through to the US, the University of Michigan, and obviously throughout Australia, talking about technology and the impact of law. And that in itself would have been very hard to do previously. It was very easy to send an email, let's get the right time zone, we use Zoom and we recorded it. And I have to say, they were done like fireside chats and the, the, the guests were fantastic. The students loved sort of 20 minute vignettes around these practitioners around the world and being able to get places without COVID. The other example is uh, we set up, I mentioned the Tokyo Olympics. We signed an agreement with Meiji University, one of the top private universities in Japan, to provide some English common law studies by tapping them into our existing system. So we enabled these Japanese law students simply to have access to our own Moodle sites, our learning management system, with access to all the videos on common law and case law and listening to the classes. And they could do it for credit or no credit without traveling. And I don't know if you're aware, but in Japan, online learning is very unusual. That's not a concept they, they have. They very much have that tradition of the teacher and the classroom. And because of COVID, were willing to open the door and provided us with some great opportunities to teach their students in a whole new way. We gave a few demonstrations to their faculty and what we treated as, and I'm sure you know the expression BAU, business as usual, this is our normal way of doing things. And for our Japanese colleagues, it was like, wow, do you, how do you do things like that? How do you do student engagement? And that was wonderful to help, I guess, upskill. Uh, and I said, Meiji is a top private university with lots of money and resources, but it built some great friendships. But I have to say, I had visited Meiji the year before. So I built up that personal relationship and so Zoom because that supplement. So I think we have a long way to go, but maybe there's some examples and others will have more. Professor Nelson. 
I think Michael uh, gave uh, wonderful examples of the, the pros and, and the cons perhaps. I think for us, um, both at, you know, my, my new role and where I was previously, our concern has really flowed from the creation of virtual community, right? That which is outside of the classroom in a traditional sense, but which reinforces the classroom experience and which frankly just allows the students to thrive and to be, to be more holistically well. Because I think one of the things that this pandemic has rendered uh, bare, laid bare, is the well-being question, right? Um, there has been, I think, you know, we have to be real about instances of depression. We have to be real about anxiety and real fear during, for oneself and one's loved one during the pandemic, which interferes with one's ability to excel in the virtual classroom and other dynamics that were there before, but given everything that has transpired in 2020 has been elevated, right? Or exacerbated or caused. So, you know, I think that virtual um, community building is something we're in, trying to be more intentional about, whether that's, you know, social events and cooking classes and trivia nights and movie nights, but just trying to recreate, especially for our first year students who did not have the chance to have, for example, like this panel of friends who we'd study together or go out together or hang out together, um, walk from classroom to classroom. How do we recreate those experiences that fortify the learning is a big challenge, at least for us coming into these uh, virtual um, online educational uh, spaces. So, Professor so we could learn a lot, I think, from, from you all, uh, Michael, in terms of how you've done that. So Professor Jensen um, uh, uh, was more, uh, well, he said that his, his work mostly was experiential learning, which meant a lot of traveling. And um, how have you translated um, your uh, experiential teaching and learning um, during the pandemic uh, using the technology? Well, I, um, I'm probably a five million mile flyer lifetime, and I am experiencing a world-class case of cabin fever. Uh, and uh, I, I don't need to go back to the, the level of travel that I was doing before the pandemic, uh, but I would like to get out of town. Uh, the uh, uh, exchanges are coming back. Uh, faculty and student exchanges are coming back to the US, and I want to say that with a great deal of confidence. Uh, when the vaccine is, is fully uh, uh, deployed, I think we will uh, uh, open borders in ways that uh, have been closed over the last few years to international students. And I, th I think the, this international exchange is extraordinarily important. And I think the vast majority of my colleagues across the country uh, agree with it. It's a damn shame uh, where, we, where we are today in uh, student exchanges. Um, uh, there, there are some unanticipated benefits of uh, distance learning. Um, I sit on the board of American University of Afghanistan. We are fully online now and have been for the course of the pandemic. Students wanted to come back to class because other law schools in the country were going back to class and, and, and meeting unsafely in class. Uh, but then uh, a bomb went off at uh, Kabul University uh, law faculty a couple of weeks ago and suddenly students thought maybe this online learning isn't such a bad alternative. Uh, I, I give that as an example of, you know, being able to cross over all sorts of insecurities to deliver really worthwhile learning products uh, in the midst of uh, a, a civil war, essentially. Um, I think some of my students have suffered from Zoom fatigue. I, I think we can't stay online as long as we would like in, in, in the classroom. I think uh, there's some, some good empirical uh, work around this. Uh, but I've got to say, I, I taught a seminar uh, this fall. Um, it was the smallest seminar I'd, I'd taught in my years at Stanford, but it was one of the best. Uh, and I couldn't believe it. It was on Zoom. Um, so, Professor Jensen, since we just have one minute to go, we'd like to have um, uh, the last word from Professor Chesterman. Sorry to yeah. cut you off. Just one minute. No, it's okay. I, I was finished. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, well, look, just very briefly, um, I agree that the international dimension is important, but also the interpersonal dimension. And that's really where Eric, I think, was going. The limitations of Zoom. This is a great way to connect. I'm 
delighted to be in both Delhi and in Hawaii and in Stanford and in Armadale. Uh, but there are, there are limits. And although I think, for, as Michael was saying, for mature age learners, time sensitive learners, this might be the most efficient way to learn, particularly for undergraduate students. I think the point of a university, it goes back to what I said about law being both a vocation and a subject of study. So the, the university experience should be more than just about acquiring knowledge. It should be about acquiring and understanding yourself. And that's an inherently dynamic process. So uh, I, like all of you, I'm looking forward, hopefully, to meeting up with this panel and indeed with Raj, who's reappeared in Delhi or Singapore or Hawaii somewhere soon. <laughs> or Palo Alto. Palo Alto would be great. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, for this fascinating panel and we have really enjoyed and, uh, you know, uh, engaged with a very important topic. You actually set the stage for some more discussions. We are also celebrating the Constitution Day in India today. So just 15 minutes from now, uh, Honorable Dr. Justice uh, D.Y. Chandrachud, uh, Judge of the Supreme Court of India, will be delivering uh, uh, the Constitution Day lecture on a theme that some of you reflected, which is constitutionalism, liberal democracy, and enlightened citizenship. So uh, many uh, things that you said does uh, reflect on some of the core values of that theme itself. So I'm grateful to uh, Camille, Michael, Simon, and of course, Eric, and also Prabhakar for being part of this uh, thematic session. Thank you very much.